Hey, good morning, folks. I tried putting that thing on YouTube, but it's not letting me, Kim. Sorry. Just put that thing on there yourself, Kim, okay? So everyone will see it anyway. How's everybody doing today? Christine. <laughs> All right. We're going to get started, I suppose. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody this morning on Facebook and on YouTube. I see you all right there, right there. And uh, Kim is going to put a post up there saying we're not going to tolerate any more nastiness. Okay? So, anyway, let's, uh, we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Our gracious God and our Father, we're thankful this morning that we can gather together around the Word of God. And we can study, we can understand, 
of the things that you have written in this book for us. Mostly things that pertain to Israel. I pray that today will be a time of blessing, a time of edification, and certainly a time of education. And uh, I pray that hearts will be open, ears will be attentive, and that people will receive this message and let the words of the, of the scripture minister to them, and not the philosophies and opinions of men. I pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I just wanted to share something real quick because, um, you know, I have, there's a, we have a lot of good friends in, to this, with this ministry that, are, that consider themselves part of our ministry. And this week, again, people came forward and said, we don't want you to stop preaching. We don't want you to quit. And so, you know, you can rest assured I'm not going to go anywhere because the people have spoken. The people have voted. And I want to thank everyone who has decided that they were going to support us and, and, and keep us going in the ministry. And uh, for that, I'm, I'm very thankful. Um, I wanted to show you something because can you see this? This is my box of, guess what? Well, here's frankincense. But these are Young Living essential oils. And the reason I'm showing you this is Chris and Sandy Hodges, you know, they sent me two, two, not one, two uh, diffusers. One is right up there, one's in my bedroom. I just wanted to share this with you because these are such a blessing. I like, every, you know, sometimes when I start diffusing, which is every day, but when I start, I'll sometimes I'll private message Chris and say, hey man, I'm doing, I'm doing Idaho blue spruce today. Or I'm doing pine today. Or one of my favorites is Northern Lights black spruce. And... There's this other one, like I got Chris's, he sent me this cup here, mister, right, because uh, it's a thing between him and me, Rodney, a helper of our joy, he sent me this cup, and he also sent me this Young Living essential oil called mister, <laughs> mister, and you know, I was diffusing just, the, I usually blend them. Like, I'll put some, maybe a little orange and pine and things like that. But this mister, wow. I did that by itself. It's got, I mean, I can't read it right now. It's tiny, but it's got the most unbelievable ingredients in here. And what a great aroma. Relaxing. And I play this music that you've just listened to when I'm working on my messages. And... um my diffusers right there and you know I'm gonna tell you if you don't have one contact Sandy and let her help you with that she's she's fantastic at that okay and uh, she'll help you get your you know your essential oil life going all right because these things are amazing they really are and before I begin today <coughs> I wanted to I wanted to share with you something and what I'm going to share with you is these are words that God never said. God never said what you're going to hear right now. Okay? So, remember, God never said this. Today I started loving God never said that I'm right back where I've always should have been You are such a bad person I got over you just long enough 
to get my heartache man to let my heartache man because you were such a bad person and you sinned and I had to turn my back on you and then today I started loving you again God never said those words <laughs> Amen. God never said, today, I started loving you again. Amen. He never said that. So we're going to, <laughs> we're going to continue now, okay? Or we're going to begin, I should say. Um, as we begin today, I will tell you this, that this message today is not is not for babies this is going to be a deep message that i'm going to suggest before you before i even begin that you will listen to it again like you know get a good night's sleep tonight and tomorrow listen to this message again because there are concepts in here you you already know you already know <clears throat> what we are going to talk about but you have to put these things in order okay now you remember this this mosaic how we talked about every piece of glass that formed this beautiful cat mosaic represents a verse of scripture and if one if just one piece of glass was missing if one verse of scripture is missing is not in its right place it's not is not in its proper place you'll know that something is lacking okay so this is this picture this to me this mosaic speaks so loud to someone like me who's a who's a visual i'm a visual person which is why i use powerpoint but the scriptures that we will look at today will will run the the, the the gambit of the whole word of god you know i've been striving to give you you know a bird's eye view of the scripture i i kind of like always try to do that and this message is going to be no different this is this is a bird's eye view from the beginning to the end and the thing is this the more that I grow into this understanding of the salvation of all, the more the scriptures opened up to me. Last Sunday, I mean, it was important for everyone to remember that Jesus Christ was not speaking to us. I mean, basic as that may seem, it's not basic at all when you consider that the majority of the teaching of eternal conscious torment comes from the four gospels which those of you listening know were not written to us so why is it that so many are unwilling to acknowledge that jesus christ was not speaking to us and continue to spew out hatred and venom and have tantrums and episodes that would embarrass any mother in any department store you know it's quite an enigma I mean it's it's very difficult to understand and you know besides the four Gospels there are many other things in the Word of God that have nothing to do with us you know for example the book of life you know we read about the book of life in the Word of God we find it in the book of Revelation and I'll show you a couple of other places today today but uh, before we look at some of the verses let me ask you this is the book of Revelation prophecy of course you will say yes are we a part of prophecy and of course you will say no and of course I will say are you sure are you certain because I know a lot of people who say that we are not a part of prophecy but when they arrive at the book of the Revelation they forget that the wheels fall off the apple cart apples are all over the sidewalk 
And all of a sudden, we are in the book of the Revelation with all its threatenings. And why do people who know better continue to do that? I mean, I don't get it. Is it because they're on the primeval calf path? You'll have to listen to last Thursday night's message to understand what that means. But one thing that I'm certain of is that myself and many of you, thankfully, are no longer on the primeval calf path. Amen? We were on it, but thank the Lord we recognized the deception. We veered off the path, broke out of the box, saw that there's a lot more to the Word of God than what we were taught. And the worst enemy, the worst enemy to the primeval calf path and the box that creates that kind of person or the box that people are in is a person who opens the Bible and says, God, show me what your word says. And then that person believes the words on the page. Remember, this, this was King David's prayer. Psalm 119, verse 18, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Right? When, when that becomes the prayer of any believer that is in a box... You know what will happen? They, you know, they begin realizing that they're hearing the same thing over and over and over again and rehashed over and over for the past 50 years. You know what I'm saying? You know, Matthew chapter 10, Jesus what, t told them, don't go to the Gentiles. You know, James wasn't writing to the 12 tribes of Israel. What about the Hebrew epistles? They weren't written to us. Yeah, okay. Healing's not for today, okay? Why Pentecost isn't for us, you know, as though we don't know that. Water baptism, you know, it's not water baptism. We're baptized by the Holy Spirit. And th I understand that. But how many times do you have to keep hearing the same things over and over and over again for 50 years? And as you, you know, when you're in the box, when you were in the box... And as you listened to the same things over and over again, all of a sudden, the box gets smaller, and it gets smaller. And then you begin pushing your elbows against the sides of the box, and you begin pushing at the top of the box, and all of a sudden, you break out of that box, and you look back at that thing, and you look around you, and you say to yourself, I was trapped. They had me exactly where they wanted me. And it's not just the box I left. I mean, it's the box that everybody, like every street corner has a, a different box, right? I mean, you name it, Methodist, Lutheran, go down the line. And they're located on every street corner across the United States and across, the, uh, across other countries. And the people who are in those boxes hear the same things over and over and over again, ad infinitum to ad nauseum, and it never ends. And so they follow the primeval calf path. And again, if you don't understand that phrase, you have to listen to last Thursday night's message. But when you break free, you know, what a relief. You look at, you look at all the people, right, angry that you're no longer in the box. And what are they doing? They're trying to protect this box. But, to no avail, once you get out of that box, then you can say, that's when you can say, now I truly understand Israel's program. It's for them. It's not for me. And you realize that in the box, you were limited to what, the men teaching in the box knew. And all their students, they're all repeating the same things, like a bunch of parrots, okay? But outside the box, you are unrestrained to learn what God wants you to know 
And lo and behold, there's a lot more to see and there's a lot more to learn when you're not in that thing. So outside the box, we <laughs> can't Christianity. So outside the box, we will be rightly dividing and truly and genuinely separating Israel's program from the people who live in the dispensation of grace. Amen? So we're going to continue rightly dividing because that's the right thing to do, right? We, we must divide Israel's program from ourselves, right? And the people that I learned right division from are also the same people who will tell you that Jesus Christ was not speaking to you. But then they'll take what Jesus Christ said as he was speaking to Israel and stick it on you who are alive today. So who's creating the confusion? Who is it? You know, I mean, everyone who learns how to, who learns right division at first says, boy, that cleared up all the confusion, right? Especially when you take into consideration that there is nothing in Paul's epistles about burning in a fiery torture chamber for all of eternity. You know, I heard a preacher a couple weeks ago quoting Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 7 to 9, and that's the second coming of Jesus Christ. And he said, see, Paul talked about eternal destruction from the presence of the Lord. Well, yeah, Paul was talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is in perfect keeping with Israel's program and has nothing to do with us. Well, I will guarantee you that if you will faithfully rightly divide Israel's program from our program, literally all the confusion will vanish away and go away forever. So, what we're going to do today, I want to talk about the book of life. And I want to look at how the book of life fits into the word of God and that it has a purpose far greater than than we ever thought so i'm going to put these verses up here today and um, i suggest you write the verses down go back later and look at the verses and read the verses all the verses we're going to look at today read the verses on the page okay and a lot of confusion will leave i'm telling you a lot of it will leave about this subject of eternal conscious torment when you understand Israel's program and what God is doing for those people, excuse me. My eyes are watering for some reason. I don't know why. Ah, there we go. <coughs> okay, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. According to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged. Wait a minute. Didn't I just read that? And they were judged according to their works. And the sea and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay? Now, this verse scares a lot of people. Verse 15. Scares a lot of people. But the book of life is also mentioned several other places in the book of the Revelation and in, and in the Word of God itself. For example, Revelation 3.5 He that overcometh 
the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Remember, Jesus Christ returns with all the holy angels. Remember that, Matthew 25, Matthew 25, 31. Now, there's another verse in the book of the Revelation, but I will share it with you at the end of this message, and there's a reason why I'm going to do that. So the last book in your Bible obviously speaks of the book of life, but it has to do with the people who are the subject of prophecy. That's not you. That's not me. Okay? So, where does the book of life come from? Who wrote it? How do people get into it? How do they get blotted out of it? Okay, so I'm going to read a few verses from the book of Exodus. This is the, the, the place where, the, remember they made the golden calf? And Moses came down from the mountain? And boy, was he upset! Right? In Exodus chapter 32... Notice verse 30, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, I underlined it. This is not in the Bible, okay? That's my underline. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. So Moses here understands that his name is in the book. It's in God's book that he wrote. God wrote the book of life. Okay, God wrote that. <clears throat> and Moses asks God to blot him out of the book, not the people. So their names are in the book. Verse 33, And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So think about this very carefully. Okay, So let's establish a precedent here. What book in the Word of God several times says that people's names can be blotted out of it? What book is that? Well, we read some verses in the book of Revelation a few minutes ago. It's the book of life. People can get their names blotted out of the book of life. So in these verses, who are these people? Who are these who are already in the book of life? They're already there. Moses is asking God not to blot them out. Blot me instead. Who are those people? The nation of Israel are in the book of life. It's their book. Because remember, by this time, God has severed Israel from all the nations of the world. Right? So it's not the nations that are written in the book of life. It's these people. These people here. You know, we'll look at a verse in Paul's epistles that, that shows us this. Uh, the, people, the people that are named in the verse are all little flockers. You know, when Paul was first arrested on the road to Damascus... He was surrounded by little flockers who helped him bring the gospel that Jesus was the Christ to those who had rejected him. Right? They're the ones who labored with Paul. They helped Paul. Paul was not surrounded by Gentiles who knew nothing about God or God's plan for the world. Okay? So I'm talking about Philippians chapter 4 verse 2. He says, I beseech Eudeus and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, 
true yoke fellow. Listen, folks, you know that we are not yoke fellows, right? You know we're not yoke fellows. I mean, the very thought of yoke fellow is forced labor. It's people who are under a performance-based program, and it has to be done a certain way or else. Yeah, Israel's program is performance-based. Do it this way or else. So yoke fellow has nothing to do with grace. It has to do with perfect obedience or else. Verse 3, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Their names are in the book of life. Now, I don't have time to prove to you that all these people are little flockers. I can, and I have done it before, but I don't have time to do it today. But they're in, their names are in the book of life because they were born into the nation of Israel. And this is the only time Paul mentions the book of life. And it's in connection with those who labored with him, who were yoke fellows with him, and they're under an obedient program. And You know, that's why he told those people, work out your own salvation. Work it out with fear and trembling. Okay? So, I'm going to read these verses again. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. The implication is clear that all the people of Israel have their names in that book of life, and Moses asks God to blot him out instead of the people. But God's answer is not what Moses requested. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. That's it, Moses. That's my final answer. So, how do you get into the book of life? And how do you get blotted out of it? They got into the book of life by virtue of their birth into the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God even says of Israel, before you were in the womb, I knew you. He doesn't say that about the Gentile nations, the heathen nations. Okay. Th that, so that's how they get into the book of life. By virtue of their birth into the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they get blotted out by sinning against the Lord. Now, you need to understand that getting blotted out here does not equal eternal conscious torment in God's burning inferno. That's not what that is. It's simply the punishment for Israel that there are some of them that will not reign in the kingdom when the kingdom is established. Okay, now notice, <clears throat> I'm going to put this verse up here again. And the verse is talking about those people going into Daniel's 70th week. And look what he says. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels okay you see that so those who overcome will not be blotted out they're not going to be blotted out notice this verse Revelation 3.21 to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Okay? But if their names are blotted out, they're not sitting down with Christ in his throne when he reigns. 
See? So you can see the blessing of being an overcomer in Daniel's 70th week, right? Another blessing of overcoming is found in Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Now, we're going to be looking at the second death in a moment, but they're, the people who overcome, they're not going to be hurt by that. Okay? So those that overcome get to reign with Jesus Christ, and they will not be hurt by the second death. Now, you think about this, and you let this sink in. Who does get hurt by the second death? Well, it's those whose names are blotted out, right? That's why we read these words. Revelation 20, 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. Let me ask you this. Who are the people who are judged by their works? Is it you? <laughs> no. Then is that talking about you? No. Who are the people who are judged by their works? It's Israel, right? Israel, not you. Rightly dividing the word of truth means you rightly divide Israel's program from who you are and, and the dis people living in the dispensation of grace. Are you under a performance-based acceptance program with God? No, you are not. Notice verse 14, and death, and death, death. You know, Paul spoke about death, right? What is death? Well, we looked one time a few weeks ago, death is a return, but I'm not referring to that part of death right now. I'm referring to the way Paul talked about death. Death is an enemy. And death is the last enemy that will be destroyed. It will be destroyed, right? So death will be thrown into the lake of fire. But listen, death is not a thing. It's not an object. It's not tangible. It's intangible. It's, it's, it's the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death, okay? But it's something that an end will be put to it, okay? You can't purify death. You cannot purify death. It gets eliminated. It gets destroyed. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Okay? And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because when death is gone, the only thing left is life. See, God is, a, God is into life. Death is what Adam brought upon humanity. But death is going to end. And then he goes on to say, death and hell. Now, the word hell here is the word Hades. And everyone listening now should know that that's the grave. The grave is where death is held. Okay? Remember Paul said, oh grave, where is thy victory? Remember that? There's the verse. Oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave. Where is thy victory? No. There it is right there, see? It's getting dealt with right here. It's getting Death is getting dealt with right here in Revelation chapter 20. Okay? And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So the lake of fire puts an end to death and an end to the grave. So God is saying, you're done, and you're done. Amen? And then he wipes his hands of the whole human experience that Adam foisted upon all humanity because of his disobedience. So those two things are intangible, right? They're not objects. Okay. But now notice people. Not just any people. 
people who were born into the nation of Israel and their names were put in the book of life. And then because, be, follow this, follow this, because they sinned, because they did not overcome, their names were blotted out of the book of life. And now they're at the great white throne judgment and John says, and whosoever was not found in the book of life, and he's referring to people of Israel because they're the only ones who are in the book of life, nobody else, were cast into the lake of fire. Right? So let me reiterate because you need to understand this, folks. You need to understand this. This is talking about Israel and their process. And this is them. And how are their names blotted out from the book of life? By sin and by not overcoming. Okay, so when we read the words, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, we know this. It's talking about the people of whom Paul said, and so all Israel shall be saved. Some didn't make it into the kingdom to reign with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. Well, where were they during that time? They were in the grave. But now death and the grave gave them up. And they're going into the lake of fire. Now, there's two things about the lake of fire that I want to share with you. And I want you to listen very carefully to this, okay? The first thing is this. The lake of fire. The lake, it's not a real lake. The book of the Revelation is a book of symbols. You know, remember we talked about Revelation chapter 6, the, the, the four horses of the apocalypse. And we said that those horses are not going to come galloping over a hill somewhere. Literally, because the horses represent things. They're symbolic. The book of Revelation is a book of symbols and, you know, metaphors and pictures. The second thing about this lake is that it's not real fire. The word for fire, as we studied before, is the word. Is, is, the Greek word is P-U-R, where we get our English words pure and purify. And that is exactly what God is going to do for those people whose names were blotted out of the book of life. They will be purified. The second death is the death of their sin natures. And it's a special process for them to enter into the eternal state. See that? When you understand this is dealing with Israel, this is all dealing with Israel. Okay, because we know who these people are. And, you know, like last Sunday and last Thursday, we talked about it. And, you know, let me remind you. Remember these verses? Matthew 25, 46, these shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal. You know, in Matthew chapter 25, they were supposed to be helping people. Remember, feeding, clothing, visiting, giving them water. But they didn't do that. And not only that, they sinned. They, they didn't overcome. So they go away into Aeonian punishment, which is a limited period of time which in that case is the thousand year reign of Christ. That's where they're going. It's a punishment to not like who shall be punished with everlasting Aeonian destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. They're not going to be reigning with him. Why? They did not overcome. But those who do overcome sit with him in his throne and witness the glory of this power, and they're they they're with the pre they're in the presence of the Lord. The others get their names blotted out of the book of life. Okay, these are the ones who get their names blotted out of the book of life because they did not overcome. These are the people right here. Okay, they're not overcomers. They're not the overcomers that we read about, uh, whose names would not be blotted out of the book of life. That's not these people. These are the ones whose names are blotted out. The overcomers are not punished with Aeonian, limited destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. 
they go on to reign with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. Okay, but these people are definitely blotted out, but not into eternal conscious torment in God's barbecue pit. See, when you arrive at these verses and you leave out all the other verses that have to do with how God is going to deal with Israel, that's how you end up butchering these verses and adding meaning to these words that absolutely have nothing to do with anything these hellfire and brimstone preachers are adding here. The people who overcome are spoken of like we're going to look at some verses, more verses in the book of Revelation right now. We're going to look at the people who overcome, who overcame. What happens to them? Okay, What happens to them? So, see, this is why I want you to listen to this again. Get You want to get this whole scenario, the bird's eye view of this, of what the Bible is teaching about these people, their program, God's plan for them. Okay, but notice Revelation chapter 6 verse 9 and when he had opened the fifth seal I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God you need to understand this is a vision this is a vision John's not literally seeing people's souls souls are invisible you can't see a soul but in the vision okay he saw the souls of them that were slain. We're going to read later that they were beheaded. They were beheaded for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Okay? So the ones asking the questions in the next verse are those who were slain. Okay? They were beheaded. Notice verse 10. And they crowd with cried with a loud voice saying how long O lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth <clears throat> and white robes were given unto every one of them and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season now you remember in first peter chapter one peter said um uh, Wherein now ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, though now for a season. How long is that season? Well, it's Daniel's 70th week. But notice that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants, Paul would call them yoke fellows, right? You are not a fellow servant. And you are not a yoke fellow, okay? Until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. See, that's going to happen in Daniel's 70th week. So in verse 11, you know, they rest for a season. And again, how long is that season? Well, it's Daniel's 70th week, right? Until their fellow servants... And their brethren, these are the overcomers, those who were not blotted out of the book of life. Okay? And John, you know, and this is say, wait, wait until they're killed also. Right? So here's a group of people. These are overcomers. Their names are not being blotted out of the book of life. Okay? They're going to reign with Jesus Christ. Watch. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast. They were overcomers. Neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived. Now they were had been beheaded. Right? They were beheaded. Saw the souls of them that were beheaded during Daniel's 70th week. 
and for the word of God, for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, they were overcomers. And they got killed. They got killed. But then, at the second coming of Jesus Christ, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. They lived. There was a resurrection there. But the rest of the dead, those who were not overcomers, those whose names were blotted out of the book of life, lived not again. That's the everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. That's the Aeonian separation, destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. They're not going to witness that. That is a punishment. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. When he says this is the first resurrection, he's referring to verse 4 of those who lived and reigned and were resurrected before the kingdom was set up, they took part in the first resurrection, which took place at the second coming of Jesus Christ before he began to reign. The others were blotted out. And we read about them at the great white throne judgment being cast into the purifying lake of fire. Amen? Now, if you... When you read, like, I never in my life saw what I'm seeing now. <clears throat> I told my wife last night, I said, the things I'm preaching tomorrow morning came to me this past week. These are, you know, you need to look who's overcoming, who's being blotted out. And now you can see them. The, the, in verse 4, you got those who overcame, and they lived, and they reigned with Christ. They lived, and they reigned with Christ. But the rest of the dead, the ones who were not overcomers, the ones who were blotted out of the book of life, the ones that Jesus Christ said get everlasting punishment. And Paul said the punishment is destruction from the presence of the Lord. They're not reigning with Christ. Can you see that? Man. That's why I said you got to go back over this and look... You should need to write down all these verses that we're looking at and then read them all and you'll see it. And remember, when you're looking at verses like this, like verse 4, when you're looking at a verse like verse 4, you can start seeing now that there is a book of life, that there are people who are not blotted out of it, that there are some people who are blotted out of it. Okay? Now, now, I said at the beginning of this message that I there was a verse there was verses in the book of the Revelation that I wanted to keep for later. So here they are, okay? And the next verses that we're going to look at, they're speaking about the dragon who is Satan, right? Now notice this. Revelation 13:7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Now the saints are who? <laughs> let me let me help you, man. Because the saints throughout the entirety of the Word of God are the little flock, are Israel. I mean, whether it's the little flock or then Paul calls them the election in Romans 11, it's always them. You know, I know some pastors say, Oh, to the saints at our church, and oh, you did such a great job. Thank the saints at our church. No, nobody in the dispensation of grace is a saint today. Okay, you're not. You're just not. So, some of you may have to get over that. I don't know. But it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Notice this. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. That's the, the dragon. Notice, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. These people from the kindreds and the tongues and the nations and all them that dwell on the earth, which is those outside of God's own nation, the nation of Israel, 
their names are not in the book of life and they never were in the book of life. And therein lies the secret to understanding Israel's program. You know, contrasted to our program. You know, a couple weeks ago, or recently, I said uh, I said something like, rightly dividing is not enough. I mean, knowing that we must separate Israel's program from the dispensation of grace is important, but it's not enough. We must understand Israel's program. We must understand the inner workings of their program, what God wanted to do through them, what God never accomplished through them, what God is going to do with them, and most importantly, the process that he will bring them through to get them to do what he has planned for them to do. Okay? Knowing that we need to rightly divide is not enough. Knowing to rightly divide is basic to understanding the Bible. But if you don't know why you're rightly dividing their program from ours, then you're no further along than any denominational believer in the world. We need the whole Bible to understand Israel's program. And I believe this is where right division fell short. And you know they stopped short because they added everyone into Israel's program of being purified to become what God wanted them to become. And that's where I believe the failure is. You know, understanding that there are some who will not be blotted out of the book of life, some who will be blotted out of the book of life, and some who never were in the book of life, ever, ever, ever. And next week, next week we're going to understand in between those two extremes of Israel and their program, how is that going to work on our behalf? You know, God has a plan for the nations of the world, and it's to be blessed through the nation of Israel. But they have to go through their thing in order to become that kingdom of priests that will be a blessing to all the families of the earth, all the kindreds of the earth, right? And next week, that's what we're going to be looking at. When Jesus Christ died on that cross, the writer to the Hebrews, I, I showed you this last week and I thought, you know what? I have, to, I have to do this again because, look at this, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He put away sin. He put it away. You know, I, this cup, Mister, I put it over there on top of a speaker I have over there, and it's, and I look at it all the time, Mister. It reminds me of when I preached, when I preached about, when I shared about a preacher who was preaching. Anyway, I'm not going to go through that whole thing again. But Chris, Chris Hodges knows what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Many of you do too. But then, on that cross, on that cross, we also read that God was in Christ. What was he doing? Reconciling the world. Reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. You know why he's not imputing their trespasses on them? Because Jesus Christ put away sin. He put it away. Yeah, but what, what when somebody sins, God's not imputing it to them. God's not imputing it to them. I know it's hard for those of us who were brainwashed into thinking 
that this didn't mean what it said. Didn't mean that doesn't mean what it says. No, it has to mean something. Oh no, p- people use that to, to people you people who believe in each universal reconciliation use that verse. Okay, well if it doesn't mean that, what does it mean? I personally never use the phrase universal reconciliation. It's a man-made phrase. Just like hyper-dispensationalism. I guess there's a new phrase that came out recently. (laughs) Anyway. But those phrases, those man-made terms are designed to scare people from what the Word of God plainly teaches and says. That God was not imputing. God was in Christ reconciling the world. God is not angry with the world. And when he says to be reconciled, it's something that people already are. They just need to enter into an understanding of it. And when they do, wow, what a relief. God's not angry with you, man. Jesus Christ died for you. And hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. That's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And verse 19. I like reading it right from my Bible. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. God's at peace with the world. And when he says, be ye reconciled, you know, given, have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ that be ye reconciled just simply means be at peace with God because he's at peace with you. He's already at peace. That's what, not, that's what that verse means. 2 Corinthians 5.19 is that God is at peace with the world. As bad as the world is, as evil as the world is, God is not imputing their trespasses unto them. And that is something that is so difficult for people to comprehend today. But nevertheless, it's what the Bible teaches. You know? I just got to the point in my life where I have to stop listening to men and what they think and what they say and what does the Bible say. I'm just going with what the Bible says. You know? it's To me, it's so much easier. And I've never been at peace in my life like I am now. Ever, ever, ever in my life have I ever been at peace. Knowing what I know now and what I understand now about God and His work. And, and how he's, it's his, his purification process for Israel. And when He appeareth, He's like a refiner's fire. And man, it, all, everything falls into place. Just like pegs. Do, 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 do. They all fall into place perfectly. You don't have to twist anything. Move A square peg doesn't go in a round hole, okay? Don't put me in Israel's program. I don't fit in that program. And you don't fit in that program. You're not a round peg. You're a square peg. <laughs> Israel's round. We're the squares. We're the, we're the ones out of that thing. Amen? So I would encourage you, folks... Go back over this message. I, would, I wouldn't do it right this second. I would wait. Have a good night's sleep later on. Maybe tonight if you want to. Tomorrow, definitely. Go back over all these messages. I mean, all, over all these verses. And look at how they all tie in. And they are perfectly explained. And you don't have to twist anything. The only ones who hate this are those who, well... That person didn't believe like I believe. They're going to hell for eternity. What a cruel bunch of people. What a cruel. That's not what God teaches in his word. It's not, it's not found anywhere in his word. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, I just pray that the words found in your book would be forged upon the tablets of our heart that we would enter into this true understanding of Israel's program your plan for them how they're going through the fire to be purified to be refined 
and to become what you intended for them to become. I pray, Lord, if anybody doesn't understand that Jesus Christ died for them, that, listen, that they would just acknowledge and believe and be reconciled to God and be at peace with God. And it all happens through the faith of Christ. The faith of Christ is what get, gives all of this to us. I pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So hopefully we'll see you next week. I don't think I'll be doing anything on Tuesday night, folks, but next week. I hope that this message is a blessing to you and that um, you think about these things. Go back over this. Write these verses down. Highlight them in your Bible. However you mark your Bible, go mark those verses and look at them and read them and internalize them and make them personal to yourself so that you won't be led astray by people trying to stick you in Israel's program like every denomination does. And by every denomination, I mean every denomination I ever left, including the last one. Which, in my opinion, is the worst of all because they should know better. They should know the truth. But they reject it. They reject it. I pray for them. I really do. I pray their eyes would be open. I don't think they'll ever humble themselves. I talk to these people sometimes. And the minute I quote a verse, That's not what that means! It's like, okay, okay, okay. You're not open. You're not open to listening to the Word of God. We're not talking. We're not talking anymore. Okay? When you're open, and you want to sit down with an open Bible, and you want to see what the Bible says, I understand what you think it says. I understand. I know what you were taught. I know what you were taught. I used to teach it. And I understand but you have to humble yourself. It's not easy to admit you were wrong. But these people are just plain flat out wrong. And I'm sorry, but I'm not backing down. I'm sorry. I am not backing down from this. This is the most wonderful, beautiful message I ever heard and understood in my life. Straight from the scripture. Straight from the scripture, straight from the word of God. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. <coughs> okay, folks. I'm going to let you go. And hopefully we'll see you next week. And uh, remember, you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. In Christ. Amen. I love you all. And thank you for those that have stepped forward and are helping us to, to continue the ministry. Uh, you've been a real blessing. And I wish I could just thank everybody uh, personally, but I can't. It was a, There was a lot of people who stepped forward and showed us that they love us and they want us to continue and they understand the message that is being preached. And they're seeing it and they've been set free. And I'm getting so many testimonies of people who were in the box and they're out of the box and they're thrilled and they're happy and they're excited and the joy that they have now is this joy unspeakable full of glory amen so thank you folks love you all see ya